Welcome back. And so now we're ready to dive into some material. And what we're going to do in the beginning part of this course is uh, talk about various types of algorithms for manipulating data, and perhaps more importantly, provide a formal mechanism by which we can evaluate the efficiency of algorithms. This is so-called big O uh, runtime analysis. And we won't be getting into the full-blown glory of that that you might see in a formal theoretical computer science course, but I want to give you the scaffolding that when you are developing algorithms, you have the ability to think about whether these are efficient and how efficient are they and how do I compare two algorithms to determine which one is better than the other. So let's, by way of that, uh, think about searching algorithms. And arguably, search, that is looking for some information inside of a data structure, whether it's a list or whatever it is, is one of the most basic operations that you do. You look up some information um, in, a, in a database uh, looking for a person, a social security number, uh, whatever it is. So this kind of idea of searching is really fundamental to many, many things we do with data. So let's think about three different search algorithms, random search, linear search, and binary search. So let me start by defining random search. So I give you a list of numbers. For example, n equals eight numbers here. And for now, let's just make them integers and let's just shove them into a standard list um, that we've seen before. And random search says, pick a random location. So sorry, the way search works is I give you a list of information or some information and a key. I'm looking for this thing. I'm looking for the number 17, which is in this list. I'm looking for the number 127, which is not in this list. And your job is to tell me, is the item in the list, and perhaps where is it in the index here? Okay. So random search algorithm, which I'm going to go ahead and say is a really dumb thing to do, but just for by way of example, says pick a random location in the list and check it against the key. If you find it, well, then it's in the list, and you return, I found it. And if it's not, well, then try again. Okay. So one of the things you always want to think about when you are developing algorithms is efficiency. Is this efficient? And often what we do is we, we think about both what we call best case and worst case analysis. So in the best case analysis, if we have this random search algorithm, I give you a list of numbers and a key, what's the best you can hope to do in terms of the number of comparisons you have to make? Well, the best you can do is one operation. What is that? I asked you to find 17, you pick a random location in the string, and you happen to pick that location right there, and you found it. You got lucky. You won the jackpot. And so that is one operation. So the best case scenario for random search is actually pretty good. But what's the worst case? The worst case is infinite, because I never told you in this random search algorithm how to stop. So if the key is not in here, I'm going to keep looking over and over and over and over and over and over again and I will never find it because it's not there. So the worst case scenario is actually pretty bad. And even if that wasn't the worst case scenario, there's still another worst case scenario, which is going to take you a long time because you can simply get unlucky. I'm looking for seven. And because of the random number generator, it never picks index one. And it takes a really, really long time. So the worst case analysis is pretty bad. So random search, I think we can all agree, is a pretty dumb way to look for something. Just randomly stumbling around in the dark just hoping to God that you somehow find the, the, the object you're looking for, the key you're looking for. Not a very good idea. But we now have a way to think about the way we're going to talk about efficiency, which is we're going to talk about what we call best case and call worst case. Okay. So now let's think about linear search. So let me start by giving you the pseudocode. Actually, this is full-blown Python code for doing linear search. So I've got a function, linear search. It takes as input a list, which I'm going to call the list, and a key. So the list is what I had below down here, and key is, say, 17, something that is uh, you're looking for in the list. Okay. And what am I going to do? I'm going to basically search through every element of the list, starting in the beginning, going to the end. That's why we call it linear search. So I'm going to initialize a variable called index to be 0. That's the first position in the list. And I'm going to say while index is less than the length of the list, so it will go from 0 to the length of the list, which is, let's say, 8. So this um, will, will be 8. But it, since that's a less than, it will stop at 7. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. I will hit every element of the list. And I'm simply going to ask if key double sign equal is equal to the indexed element of the list 
then you found it and return index. So I'm going to return the position um, where the element is there. I could have returned a Boolean true or false, but here I'm just returning the index. And remember again, return boots you out of the function, so I'm done. I'm out of the while loop and I, I found the element. Um, if it's not the index element of the list, I'm going to increment index by one. So index plus equals one. This remember is shorthand for index equals index plus one. And I come back to the while loop and I keep iterating, 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 looking for the element. If I don't find the element, if I get to the last element of the list and key is not that element, then I break out of the while loop and I return none, which means I did not find the element in the list. Okay, so simple linear search, start at the first element, go to the last element. I could have started at the last element, gone to the first element, doesn't matter obviously, so we're gonna just do a linear search. Okay. Good. Now, let's think about what the best case and worst case is for searching. Okay, so take a second to think about that. So what's the best case scenario? I give you a list of numbers, and the best case scenario is you're looking for the first element, this one right here. And if you find it, you're done, right? Because there's a return statement that says, once I find it, I don't have to iterate through the rest of the list. So the best case scenario is one. Now what's the worst case scenario is, well, it's either the last element in the list, 37, or it's not in the list, which means I have to search, 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 get to the very end and say, ah, either I found it in this position or one more, and it's out. So the worst case scenario is n. Now, let's compare that to random search. Best case scenarios are the same. One, I, find, I get lucky in random search, I get lucky in linear search, and it's the first element. But linear search is much better in the worst case because we're not bumbling idiots here stumbling around in the dark. We will go very uh, um, um, deliberately from the first element to the last element and stop when we get there. And so the worst case scenario is n. Right, where n, of course, is the length of the list. Good. So let's do binary search now. So binary search works like this. I'm not going to give you the code for this because this is eventually going to be one of your homework assignments. Is I take a list that is, and this is important, in sorted order. So up until now, I've made no assumptions about the list. But for binary search, I'm going to assume my elements are in sorted order. Okay. And I have a key. I'm looking for 12, let's say. Okay. I go to the very middle of the list, yeah, right here. Well, so off by one because it's an even number of elements. And I ask a very simple question. Is the element I'm looking for less, is it, well, is it equal to this, in which case I'm done, I'm home, I found the element. If it's less than it, what do I know since this is in sorted order? If it's less than it, I know that the element, if it is in the list, must be over here on the left-hand side and I don't have to worry about that right-hand side. If the key I'm looking for is greater than this element, then if it's in the list, it must be on the right-hand side, and I don't have to worry about all of that information. So notice what I did by, allow, by assuming that the list is sorted, and we'll talk about sorting in a few lectures, how you get the list to be sorted in the first place, which is a whole other interesting set of algorithms and runtime complexities for that. But by being sorted, once I've made one comparison, I know more than it's this element or not this element. I know that it must be either in the right-hand side if it's there or on the left-hand side, and I've gained much more information. Why? Well, if the number I'm looking for is greater than 17, I don't have to search 14, 12, 7, 3. I don't have to search anything here. And then I don't have to search. That's going to save me a little bit of time. Okay? Now, I can do that again. So let's say the, the key I'm looking for is, is greater than it. I can come to the midway point of what's left. So either 20, let's say 34, and I ask the same question. Is it less than or greater than? And I keep subdividing, 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 okay? So for example, if I was looking for something that was less than the midway point, those elements may as well not exist, and I only have to search this list. I divide it in half, I divide it in half, and I divide it in half, and I keep doing that, okay? So let's think about what the runtime complexity of this is, okay? How much time, again, best case, worst case. So what's the best case? Best case is you get lucky. That's almost always the case, by the way, that I look at the first element, it, it's the midway element, it happens to be the element I'm looking for, I find it, I'm done, no more work to be done. So best case scenario is one. What's the worst case scenario? All right, well, we have to think about that a little bit, right? Because we're, we're dividing the list in half, so we have to think a little bit about what's going to happen. So let's think through that a little bit. Let's say I have two elements in the list, 
what's the worst case scenario? I look at, let's say I, let's, well, it's even, so I'm going to have to split it not quite in half. I look at this element, the second element in the list, it's not it, and so I have to look at this one, okay? Um, and so there's two comparisons that have to, make, to be made uh, to do that. Okay, that's easy. What if I have four elements in the list? I'm going to double the number of elements in the list. Okay, I have a list of four. I go to the midway point. It's either to the left or to the right. So I've done one comparison. Let's say I have to go to the left. All right, so I have two left. Well, if I have a, a list with two elements, how many comparisons do I have to make? Two. I have already determined that from the previous step. So when I do one comparison, I split my problem in half, and I'm back to the previous one. So it's only three comparisons. All right, what about eight? All right, I have a list with eight elements. I do one comparison. I split the list in half. Now I have a list either on the left or on the right with four elements. Well, that's three. I've done one comparison, so that's only four. Now you can see the trend. I'm going to double the size of the list, and I only add one extra comparison. That's amazing. And notice, by the way, I am doubling here from 2 to 4, 4 to 8, 8 to 16, 16 to 32, and so on and so forth. So with 32, again, I do one comparison at the midway point, and I either have to search the left half of the list that has 16 elements, the right half of the list that has 16 elements, and then I know that 16 elements cost me 5, 5 plus 1 is 6, okay? and so on and so forth. So let's go down to n. I give you n elements. How many comparisons do I have to make? Now I have to find out what is the relationship between these two, okay? And so the comparison is, I'm sure some of you will be familiar with this, is logarithmic. That is the log of n plus 1 is the number of comparisons I have to make when I have a list of n elements. Let's make sure we understand why that is. So let's see here. Uh, let's do this one line right here, 8. So log of 8 it plus 1. So what log of 8 is 3. We'll get back to why that is in a second. 3 plus 1 is 4. Log of 16 is 4. 4 plus 1 is 5, and so on and so forth. And let me just remind you on what the relationship is between log and exponentials. So if I have log 8 is equal to 4 plus 1, what that means is if I raise this, by the way, I'm doing a base uh, 2 here. If I raise this to the power 2 and I raise this to the power 2, then that is the same equality. So 2 to the power log of 8 is 8, and then that's equal to 2 to the power 5. So that's the relationship between log and exponentials, okay? So, you, you, this is, by the way, you're going to remember back somewhere in high school, your teacher was teaching you about logarithms, and you wondered, why in the world am I learning about this? This right here is why you are learning about it, okay? And we're going to be using it a little bit more, so if you're unfamiliar with this, spend a little time making sure you're uh, practiced with this. So, the worst case scenario for binary search is log base 2 of n plus 1, right? You do one comparison, and then you split it in half. Now let's go and compare. So best case for random, linear, and binary, exactly the same. You get lucky. Worst case scenario is really, really bad. Uh, not terrible, N, but this is pretty nice. Why? So let's think about what the difference between this is. When I double the length of a list in linear search, how much more work do I have to do? Twice as much work. It's linearly proportional. So if I go from 8 elements to 16 elements, I have to do eight more comparisons. When I go from 16 elements to 32 elements, I have to do 16 more comparisons. It doubles the amount of work. But with binary search, every time I doubled the length of the list, I only added one more comparison. But that makes sense, because every time I did a comparison, I simplified the problem by a factor of two. And so I can double the list, double the size of the input, do one comparison, and I'm back down to where I was before. That's incredibly powerful and incredibly efficient. If every time you double the size of your input, it only costs you one extra step, one extra comparison, that's going to grow very, very slowly in terms of the cost associated with searching. Now, there's a little bit of a conceit here, which is that we had to assume that this was in sorted order, and here we didn't. So there was a little bit of an assumption here. But with that assumption came a lot of power, which is this logarithmic search. Okay. Now, this was the informal version of runtime complexity, yeah? which is best case, worst case, how many comparisons. We are going to start to formalize this a little bit in what is so-called big O notation, which is just a little bit of mathematical notation for how you formalize this informal uh, comparison. But even that informal comparison is useful because it gets you thinking about how these algorithms work 
and notice that everything is based on the size of your input. And that's not surprising. If I ask you to multiply two numbers and ask you how expensive it is, it, well, it depends how big the numbers are. If I ask you to sort a list, it depends how big the list is. Search a list, it depends how big the, the list is, and so on and so forth. So the complexity will always be hooked into the size of your data. All right, so when we come back, we're going to start formalizing some of these concepts and bringing in some, some more formal notation to help us think about this. All right, we'll be back in a few minutes.